All right, thank you for joining us for the last session slot of, uh, of uh, Build. Hope you've had a chance to go to some of the Azure Machine Learning sessions or visit us in the, in the uh, booth. I encourage you to go and try it out at, at home, run through some of our Jup Jup Jupyter Notebooks, see how the uh, ser service works, then take it to your organization, your work, your, your uh, school, start a pilot, see how it can solve your, uh, your uh, pr problems. When you want to go and use it in pr production, you're going to run. You're going to you're going to run into a bunch of people ask, asking questions. The cloud architects, the security teams. You don't want them to say uh, no. So what we're going to talk about today are some of the things to think think about in how you organize and set up Azure Machine Learning to go and run in in an, in an enterprise. Address questions around enterprise security, cost, and uh, diff and different hard hardware choices. My name is Alex Sutton. I'm the lead uh, PM in the Azure Machine Learning team focusing on AI infrastructure and training. And I'm joined by Ted, Ted Way from our in inference team who will talk about hardware and FPGAs in, in particular. Azure Machine Learning provides a great experience for machine learning and AI development at, at all levels from custom AI and really getting into the code and understanding TensorFlow and deep, uh, and deep uh, learning to traditional machine learning and automated machine learning. And then we help you go and productize those uh, models and use it in real-time inference, in batch inference, use it in uh, da Databricks for a big, big data, push models out to I I IoT, IoT Edge or other other devices and operated in an, in an automated way. But doing that re requires thinking about how it fits into your enterprise inf inf infrastructure. So what we're, we're gonna talk about today is what it means to be an, an enterprise ready. What are some of the concepts in Azure, Azure Machine Learning? How do you organize the workspaces and artifacts like uh, storage? How do you think about authentication and authorization, uh, data in, encryption and net, uh, networking, how do you go and automate a deployment and monitor the uh, service, and then how do you think about cost? How do you understand what hardware to use, when to use CPU versus GPU, what types of G GPUs does, does Azure have, what, can, what benefit can the F FPGAs bring, bring to you, and then how to think about sort of mundane things like uh, quota. Very important if you're gonna go in and train at scale, how do you go and ask for the right sizes in, uh, in uh, Azure? This is not a data science talk, but it's for the data scientists that want to go and know how to talk to their enterprise architects, the cloud security teams, the service engineers and DevOps that are, go, that are gonna go and provision, uh, provision Azure and get things set, set, set up, or for really for, for anyone that, that needs to wear multi, a multiple of, 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 of these hats. We have both a great getting started experience in Azure Machine Learning and one that really is, and, and, enterprise ready. I do want to thank a couple of our partners that have been working with us the last couple of months to get Azure Machine Learning you know, ready for their use, in particular K KPMG, who cares very much around data security, protecting the assets of their clients as they build uh, models and do AI inf inference on, on them. And then as well as Microsoft Research, who is moving all of their interns this summer and all of the research teams to start using Azure, Azure Machine Learning. They care a lot about security too, but also the productivity of, of their users, how quickly they can deploy and, re, and re, uh, configure things, and also uh, cost. So we'll, we'll uh, start on kind of how, of how you organize work, work, workspaces and what some of these con concepts are. So kind of the typical process in, in machine learning, you go and, and pre up, up, up prepare data, clean it up, understand features, get, uh, get it ready for uh, training, go and build the models, ideate, go and op optimize them in the case of deep, deep, deep learning, do, uh, do hyperparameter tuning, package up a model, and then, uh, and, and then use it, whether it's in real-time data or, or uh, batch, batch scoring. But this is not a, a, lin not a, lin a linear process. There's a lot of iterations, loops on uh, preparing, experimenting, uh, deploying, getting telemetry back at, at every stage, and then or orchestrating things. So you may use our new data drift, drift features. Notice that a model in, in production doesn't have as good ac 
accuracy, the data that I trained on is different from the data that I'm seeing into, in a production, trigger re retraining of the model, validate it, and then uh, push, put, push it out. Doing this in, at a pr production scale re requires a lot of thought on how to organize and arc, arc, architect things. Kind of start, starts with how do you organize the resources in Azure, Azure ML? A work, workspace is the top level ARM re resource. Th uh, think of this as the, as the entry point and the container for ev everything else. It really is just a, a, a container. It's a security boundary. It's a quota boundary on how much someone can, can uh, spend. We then have a number of resources underneath a workspace that we uh, manage. Ex experiments and uh, runs, the models that you're gonna go and uh, train. Com a compute targets out that I'll do for training or for or for in, inference trained uh, models that are stored or that are tracked in the mod, 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 model registry. I then create uh, do, Docker images that I can use for a, a deployment, and we can go and, and track those uh, deployments and deploy them, say, to a to a Kubernetes cluster. You know, this then also needs to, uh, to map onto, uh, onto uh, Azure. And so in some of the key con concepts is everything starts with a uh, su subscription. It actually starts with, with an account or organization, which is the credit card or the enterprise, uh, the enterprise billing that, uh, that an organization is, is uh, using. And most enterprises will, will have many, many sub sub subscriptions. The key thing for us is a sub subscription is the home for a quota. Quota is the number of VMs or GPUs that, that, that you can use, and we use both compute quota and what we call Azure Machine Learning com, 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 compute quota. So quota is on a, on a s subscription in a region for a v, v, VM family. And region is the next con concept. Azure, Azure Machine Learning, like most every service in Azure, is specific to a region. So you say, go and give me a workspace in US West or US, or US, uh, US uh, East. We are looking at relaxing some of our, uh, our restrictions to say, I will do all my management in US East, but I wanna have a training cluster in US West, in US North, North, North Central or uh, Europe, or I wanna go and have one spot where I'm managing all of my uh, deployments, but I'll have web deployments or, or around the world. So we can give you kind of a single place to view and monitor, but have activities running in different regions of, around the world. Next concept is res resource group. It can be one of the more con confusing things in, in Azure, but everything is, is rooted in a, in a subscription, a resource group, and then the, res and then the res res resources. A resource group is an easy way to organize projects or things. I can say, here are all of the workspaces, the storage, the key vaults, everything that I need for this uh, group. It's also a uh, security boundary. So you can have a resource group, say, the owner of that resource group can manage all the workspaces there, which is separate from uh, storage. So you can still connect a workspace to storage, but separate the, uh, the ma uh, management. And then while a resource group is, is created in a region, the resources can be across multiple uh, re regions. Next thing are the res resources, virtual machines, Azure Machine Learning workspaces, data lake, storage, anything else in Azure, what you think of as, uh, as an Azure ser service. When you're in an enterprise, you need to connect, uh, you typically connect everything with a vir virtual network so the resources can talk to each other. I can talk back to the corporate network over a VPN, over ex express route. Effectively, that's the IP, IP address in Azure that's part of your, your, your company's net, a network space. The other goal here is, is often to keep resources not, not exposed out on the, on the uh, pu pu public internet. Then the last thing are uh, roles. You know, every, every subscription, resource group, and object can have one or more roles. You know, owner, contributor, or a, uh, or a custom, custom role. Now we'll talk about, you know, how, how this applies to uh, Azure, or to Azure Machine Learning. The key resources that we, that we need to run a workspace is obviously the machine learning service itself. That's the work, 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 workspace. We then, uh, by default, create storage, Azure Key Vault, a container a registry the first time that you build a image. 
We use application insights for monitoring the real-time web service, and Azure Monitor for monitoring the health, getting audit events, uh, GPU counters, and the, and the as such. If you go and create a workspace in the portal or from the SDK, we'll auto-create all, all of these things. If you want full, full control over all of the resources, you can create them separately with scripts and simply at, attach them to the workspace when pre creating it. Kind of dr drilling down one, one level into the compute that's used in, a, in the ser ser service, the main compute resources that we use are machine learning compute, which is the compute cluster used for training and batch scoring. It's based on the old bat batch AI service and builds on virtual machine sc 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 scale sets. A lot of customers are using the data science vir virtual machine as an interactive uh, development in environment. We're starting to provide that as a managed service, first with the uh, notebooks pre uh, preview that, re that we released at uh, Build. People use the Kubernetes service for the real-time scoring. We can integrate with IoT Hub for deploying models out, as well as Databricks for both data preparation as well as uh, scoring. Something that a lot of people ask is, how do I organize the, the, the workspaces? I may have tens or hundreds in, in my organization. How should I think, think about it? So I wanted to, uh, to uh, share one of the approaches that, or actually some, some, several approaches. Like we, in, in Microsoft Research, are thinking about, you know, sometimes there's an individual or a, a team or a, a pro, pro project. They're trying to get away from an HPC cluster approach where I have hundreds of users sharing a cluster and I have to have very complex uh, policies for scheduling and pr pr priority. Instead, give an isolated workshop workspace to a user or a team, give them their uh, quota, and they can work in their, in their own is isolated environment. A lot of enterprises think about this in terms of a sandbox where researchers and data scientists can do whatever they want, download packages from the internet, kind of learn and figure out what the models lo lo look like. And then as soon as I start training in the corporate network with corporate data, everything has to be locked uh, down. I think about I've got a lockdown training environment. I can only use cert certain uh, of containers, every doctor container has to be scanned with, say, twi twist lock, and I can only pull down pub public packages that have been scanned by my uh, com company. So you can still provide productivity for the data, data scientists, but in a more con more uh, controlled in environment. Then if I'm doing an automated pi pipeline, I may have one workspace for training, one for testing and validating models, and one in uh, pr pr production. Workspaces can also be used for a security boundaries. So I may have one that's that's open for everyone. I can share models. I can share data. I may have other workspaces that that, that are locked down because they're sensitive data, cust customer data. You have to have a lot more control over who's ac ac accessing it. Another way of thinking about or or organizing is is um, is I'm. Is are, am I building my workspace for interactive users or for these in, interactive runs? You know, automation, say through Azure DevOps or 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 ML pi pipelines. Every workspace has to have a storage account to share the uh, output logs, the models, the other art artifacts. A lot of our uh, customers are also setting up shared storage of a shared da data set. So say you're training image models on ImageNet, you don't want to download it every time. You want to have you know, shared st st storage accounts that all, all, all of the users can uh, use. The other re reason that we think about organizing into separate workspaces is, is around quota or budget. How many GPUs is this group allowed to use? How much money are they allowed to spend? We've only got sort of course control over quota now, but working on how we provide more of a core hour or a dollar, dollar spend limit on work, work, workspaces. Kind of ne next step is, you know, once you have your arch arch architecture, how do I set it up so it can be an enterprise ready and actually be, uh, be used in my or organization? And the questions the, secur the security teams are going to ask is, what's the authentication, authorization, and uh, roles? What's the data security story in Azure, Azure Machine Learning? What's the, what's the network se security? So the first line of, of, of authentication is to a, a work, workspace. It's an Azure resource. It's, it's deployed and managed through uh, ARM. So we use a Azure, Active, Azure Active Directory for the uh, auth 
authentication to the uh, workspace and any actions like creating a workspace, sub submitting jobs, managing uh, da da data stores. Multi-factor authentication is available if enabled in, in Azure Act Active Directory. We also support using service prin uh, principles for aut automation. It's effectively creating a user for code that's go going to run and providing that uh, code with a uh, key. Within a work, workspace, we have uh, Azure ML, ML tokens that, are, that our service gen generates and uses on the compute nodes for us to send data back to the, uh, back to the uh, service. We do this so it's got a very low uh, privilege and scope just, just for that work, work, workspace. Uh, we also support SSHing to a, a compute nodes. This is the Azure ML com compute cl cluster, so if someone wants to work interactively or a debug, we support S SSH. This needs to, to be configured right now when setting up a cluster. There's an advanced option in the portal to specify a username and password or SSH key. We're working to implement the AAD of authentication that's available for Linux v v VMs and just have to work with uh, how we install uh, with uh, a VM ex ex extensions. Uh, for the new managed notebook ser uh, service, we're using Azure Active, a Azure AD auth authentication there, so the user has to be a user of the workspace. They're assigned to a notebook server, and then it's, it's simply single, uh, single sign-on. And then the last piece is when you're creating a real-time inferencing service, inferencing service, effectively a web service or REST uh, end, endpoint, we automatically generate a uh, key, whether you're deployed to AKS or Azure, con Azure con uh, container instances. This is then, then passed as the authentication token in the HTTP header. It can also be done through the Azure S SDK run, run method, where we will go and fetch the key from the uh, service and format the request for, uh, for you. This is used if, say, you're, you're building an online inferencing service. You've got a front end, your web that's getting, say, the image that, that, that you want to class, cl classify. It'll pass to the back end service using this uh, authentication key. The next level down is around roles and scope. Every Azure service supports the three standard roles of owner, contributor, and, and uh, reader. An owner can do everything. A contributor can do everything except add ad additional users, and a reader is, is, read, is read only. There's a little bit of subtlety here. For example, the owner of a subscription is the only one that can make support requests, including quote, quote, quota requests. So we may show an error, or we have the ability to say, I'm submitting a job. If you don't have enough quota, we'll, we'll, we'll show an, 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 an error message and a re recommendation to request quota. There's a button to, to request quota in the uh, portal. The user does not have the rights to su submit that uh, a request, and it, it needs to be done by an, by an, uh, an administrator. Many services have pre-built uh, roles. We're working on a set of roles now for like a data scientist role, a uh, data engineer, engineer, a DevOps role, a, a, a workspace ad, ad, ad administrator. We'll be shipping those late, later in the uh, year. What we do have now is a custom role for the two things that are in ARM, so managing workspaces and uh, com compute clusters. So we have in our do documentation on the security and roles uh, the uh, template for a data, data scientist role. So they can run, it, run experiments submit jobs, but they can't create or delete compute or delete the uh, wor uh, workspace. We're doing this, uh, we're using this internally at Microsoft for Microsoft Re Research, where the users can go and submit jobs, but they don't, they don't want them changing the size of the uh, cluster and going over their quota or spending too, too much. So they want separation of who manages, how many resources we can use from the people that can sub sub submit jobs. Working on much finer grained uh, RBAC or role-based access co control on all of the resources or all of the objects in that uh, work, a workspace, who can create uh, data stores, who can create uh, images, who can read them, who can uh, ch change them. So for example, if you want the enterprise to say, I can only use uh, 
enterprise approved and scanned uh, images. One person can go and create and submit those uh, images and users can, can, can only ac access them and can't uh, change. Just here's an example of how we're using these uh, roles and thinking about the uh, deployment in uh, Microsoft res Research. So we have the uh, sub a subscription owner that owns the budget for the uh, team, where they're going to uh, uh, deploy. They have the notion of all of the uh, pro projects. We're typically uh, uh, doing this at the research lab uh, lab level, and there's like five or six labs are, are, are around the world. So the subscription owner then is going and creating one or more res re resource groups and assigning a capacity champion for that, uh, for one of the research research teams as the person that will go and manage the workspaces and, and uh, storage and, and security for, for that group. This is actually more of a operations or IT, IT role than a, uh, than a re, 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 researcher role, so they have their uh, compute su support team man managing this. We work with them to, aut to automate a deployment, so when a new team com com comes in, they have a parameterized script that will create the workspace, the storage, the security, the roles, the, uh, the uh, quota, and they can decide at what level they want to uh, share or separate out uh, groups. We then have one person in that group who's the workspace owner. Because they're the owner on the workspace, they're allowed to add other, other uh, users. They can also then go and manage all of the, the data stores, the images, and everything else. In some, some teams, that's completely op open, and everyone's an, an owner. In other teams, they, they, they want to lock it down and just have these uh, specific user uh, roles. So it's really, th really th uh, thinking about, is my purpose around experimentation and learning? Is the purpose a, a research group, or is it more of a pr production in environment where I need to separate out who is doing the data, data pre preparation, who's training models, who validates models, and who pushes things out into, into pr production. So there is some nuance in thinking about how I organize my, my workspaces, how I organize these, uh, these uh, roles. You can have one large workspace with all of the users, all the roles, and everything else. It gets cumbersome to, uh, to uh, manage. On the other hand, you can have tens or, or hundreds of, of work workspaces, that could be hard to, to manage too. So it's really thinking about what approach is going to work best for the problem that, 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 that I'm going to solve. Kind of the doing the data science part is rel relatively easy. Operating it at scale in a production environment is uh, hard. We've got a lot of investments in M MLOps and pipelines and everything else. There's another part of how I organize in Azure that needs to be thought, thought, thought about too. Then there's one last piece to uh, identity that, uh, that we get asked, asked about, is we need to have permissions for the Azure ML service itself to talk to your storage and your key, key vault and your, your uh, 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 container re uh, registry. We're often handling those uploads and reads or pulling containers down on the, on, onto the uh, com compute nodes. We do this through what's called a, a managed I'd, 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 Identity is just another user type in Azure Act, Active Directory, same name as the uh, workspace. When the workspace is created, we will give ourselves per those uh, permissions to all of those uh, to all of those res resources. Sometimes this is a a, a concern to co customers once they, they they understand what we're looking at and how they can segment things. It's usually fine. We are looking at are there opportunities to reduce these roles or uh, or eliminate these roles. So these are, to some degree, design decisions on our side, but it has an impact on, on customer ad, ad deployments. The most important thing is understanding what we're doing and why, what does the data flow look, look, look like, and we do provide data flow diagrams in our do documentation so you can see how we interact with Key Vault, how we interact with container registry, storage, et cetera. Next part is data, data, data security, or at a very sim simple level, is all my data encrypted at uh, rest. Azure ML does not itself manage any uh, data. We rely upon Azure uh, storage, storage that we can either create for you, which is encrypted by uh, 
default, or you can go and create your own storage accounts, use, use, use your own keys, lock it down with the firewall rules and access rules that, that you want, and simply give, simply give a permission to the workspace to, uh, to uh, uh, use it. There's also encryption in, uh, in container re registry. Within the service itself, we store metadata about your, uh, about your jobs and, uh, and, uh, and uh, metrics. It's stored in, in Cosmos DB. That's our imp implementation. That's encrypted also with, with keys managed by the uh, service. And then the ML compute, the compute, the compute cluster, the back end OS disks are stored encrypted in, in storage, again with the uh, service keys. Because the compute is effectively a PaaS service, we don't support cust customer managed keys there. These are effectively state stateless v VMs and the data is actually is stored back in uh, storage. Uh, all internal tra traffic between our our roles, talking to storage, talking to Key Vault is is in encrypted, and we make it easy to set up a secure endpoint for the online inference with uh, with uh, with Auto S SSL. We do need to uh, store connection strings to da data stores and some pa passwords. We do that in Azure uh, key, key, key Vault standard standard practice for. For, uh, for services, we do our own key, key rotation and have the ability for, to support uh, your uh, key, key, key rotation strategies as well. And then there's a link to the data, data flow di diagrams in our doc documentation. This sort of enterprise readiness top, topic is a, a li living thing. We're continuously making improvements in the, uh, in the uh, service. We're taking advantage of new capabilities in Azure and answering questions from customers we sometimes didn't think, think about. And so we're, we're regularly up, up, updating these uh, docs and expanding them with additional samples as well. Then the last piece is network security. This is a much more com complex topic because it really depends upon how your organization interacts with uh, Azure or using Express Route or not, public peering or pri 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 private peering, and kind of how complex of a solution do, do, do you want. Getting started, you're typically gonna have your workspace exposed out to the uh, internet. It's, it's, it's locked down. We support the ability to, to SSH to compute nodes, but that's uh, optional. We support the notebook v VM, so you either need to you know, have that exposed out on the internet so that I can con connect to it, or put it, be, or put it behind a virtual network or a VNet and connect to it over a VPN or ex express route. The main requirement we, we hear from enterprises, though, is that all of the Azure resources are not exposed out on the public internet without sec security. And in many cases, the compute nodes don't talk out uh, directly to the internet. All the traffic has to be tunneled through the en en enterprise network. So kind of at a, a base, we, we make sure that we can tunnel all of the traffic, like if I'm, fe if I'm fetching Python libraries or data from the uh, internet, it's gonna go out through the cor corporate network, through the firewalls, through, th through the scanning, and everything else. This is not an Azure machine learning thing, it's, it's how you configure the Azure ne networking, but we make sure that we can deploy into your, into your uh, VNet and work well in, in that in environment. Right now, we do need to talk to the internet front end for storage and the Azure batch, batch ser ser service, which is doing the underlying VM resource management and scheduling, uh, scheduling for, uh, for us. And the batch service needs an inbound port into the, uh, into the uh, v v v v VNet. This can be locked down with a network security rule or NSG to, say, to be only traffic from those Azure services in that uh, region. We publish a list of those IP addresses and are moving towards a new feature called service tags, where you can simply say, allow inbound traffic from batch service on this uh, port and not have to worry about the lower level uh, conf uh, conf uh, configuration. What we're looking to is move towards what's called service end endpoints, which tunnels all of the traffic over the, over the Azure in, internal network, so I can go from your, your VNet to uh, storage and have no traffic go out over the, uh, over the uh, internet. There's a little bit of complexity here in how we're using the various services, so working with the Azure ne networking team on how we can 
on board to, uh, to service end, end, end points and potentially not have to use service tags and the more com com complex rules. Then the final piece is how can I make sure that the enterprise people you know, on their laptops or desktops over a v VPN can go and connect to the work workspace, submit jobs, work with the no notebooks, trigger a, a pi pipeline, and then as necessary, those machines can, 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 can talk out. Uh, this is some, something that if you're in a large organization, the Microsoft C CSA teams can work with you on. Uh, it does require ex expertise. The network engineering teams tend to see a, a picture like this in our do documentation, and then it's, it's pretty straightforward to fi figure out. Then the last uh, piece is how do I go and deploy and op 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 operate this? So really what, you know, what, what, what people want is consistency in, in how I'm, I'm deploying. Figure out the recipe once and then go stamp it out for different projects, different uh, teams. You often want to have consistent naming. So if I'm going to have storage and key, and key vault and everything else and they're not, and they're not stored, go and give it a, uh, go and give it a uh, con con consistent name. Uh, what, while we have a great getting started experience through the portal and S SDK, every enterprise is not gonna wanna use our auto, our auto create. They're gonna want to make sure that they go and create the storage, the key vault, the uh, container registry and, and monitor for their, for their cor corporate standards. So it's locked down and, and secure the way that you uh, need and then, and then, and then connected to the uh, wor workspace. As part of this aut automation, you, you can also uh, configure roles, as assign users, request quota, and, and create uh, clusters. The quota requests are manual now, are manual now through the uh, portal. There will be a CLI a support for that coming over the uh, summer. Then the way to think about this is infrastructure as code. All of this that I've uh, described can be done through ARMS, ARM scripts, Azure Re Re Resource Manager, the CLI, or our S S SDK. Great way, to, great way to get started is go and create a workspace in the uh, portal. There's an option to view the JSON file, that's the ARM template for uh, deploying this. You can then go and parameterize it, look at it, and create your, and create your own uh, deployment. The other approach is to use a tool like Terraform or uh, Ansible. There's a number of services and so, uh, software that know how to deploy and manage to, uh, to uh, uh, Azure. We have one do uh, document that, that explains what the Azure resource, uh, the ARM uh, template is, how to cu customize it. We're also gonna looking at the next couple of months of expanding our documentation here and providing a sample deployment template that looks like some of these more complex topologies that I, I described to help, help, help you get started. Then the last piece is uh, mo monitoring. We're starting to push all of our telemetry and metrics to Azure uh, monitor, things like restore uh, sta state changes, when does a job start or stop or fail, does the compute node come in, in or out, all the access or audit events on the various resources and roles, things like GPU counters, uh, these will go in Azure Monitor first, then we'll build some pre-built uh, reports, start to pull things like the GPU counter into the portal and, and into our uh, tools. This is kind of the, the standard Azure way now of doing log analytics, monitoring, uh, and uh, uh, reporting. We also do use App Insights for scoring requests for the real-time real inference service. And we have a higher level activity view in the workspace that's targeted more at the data scientist using it than the operations team or the enterprise team that, need, that needs much more fine, fine, fine grain logs. Then the last piece is how do I manage cost of performance and think about the different hard, hardware choices for the work, workspace? Well, I'll hand it over to Ted. Thanks, Alex, and good, more, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for the benefits of the people who are watching this recording, I can't believe over 500 people showed up at the last session on the last day of build. Um, but uh, 
where I'll be talking about uh, managing cost and performance uh, in the context of hardware acceleration of AI models. So as you think about the models that you need to train and the models that you need to run, um, what are the options that are uh, available uh, to that? Um, I'm a program manager on the inferencing side, and so what I care about is uh, taking your machine learning model, your AI model, making it run super fast in a very cost-effective way. Um, but taking a step back, as I think about the AI space and think about the AI platform, um, these are the axes in which we want to support you. And the first one is really around what kind of AI are you going to run? Are you going to run custom AI, I'm sorry, pre-built AI using our cognitive services? Maybe you've seen some examples of that. Maybe you saw at the booth, you know, you take a picture and it'll identify your age and your um, gender and your emotion based on that, or you can do object classification, or even this real-time uh, uh, captioning that you see here is based off of our pre-built um, AI models, um, all the way down to custom models. So we'll focus on custom models and on the, the um, tools that you have for custom models. So what kind of AI do you want to run? Uh, where do you want to run the AI? Do you want to run this in the cloud? Do you want to run this on the heavy edge, which is basically a very powerful server, uh, server-grade class hardware, or PCs, um, and also the light edge, which are essentially your intelligent cameras? Um, so what kind of AI do you want to run? Where do you want to run it? And then. Uh, how do you want to run the AI? Do you want to run it on CPUs? Do you want to run it on GPUs? Do you want to run it on FPGAs? And this is what we'll cover today. Um, and, um, and we also have the option of running it on ASICs, such as uh, um, the Qualcomm chips. So as we think about cost management, um, some of the things that we offer to help you around that is really just the uh, starting with auto scaling of compute clusters. So you start with some number of nodes, and you have the capability of scaling based on that workload. Um, we also have low priority compute. So if you might have a training job, maybe it's a big batch workload or an async job, um, we have surplus capacity in which then you could uh, use in a very cost effective way. Um, they're preemptible, so uh, you don't want to use that for anything in which you won't be able to uh, have that flexibility, but, but that's available to you. We also have reserved instances and promo pricing. So this could save you as much as 72% over pay as you go. So a lot of um, competitive pricing when it comes to uh, GPU instances. And then um, in the uh, resource page on the usage and quotas view under your Azure Machine Learning Workspace, you also have the ability to look at your resource usage and cost reporting. And we're building up um, that view too uh, to, help you, uh, to help you there. And then when we talk about the types of hardware that's available in the data center, so we have CPUs. CPUs are very flexible. They run pretty much anything. And so we have a lot of general, um, general purpose uh, CPU uh, machines for you to be able to do your uh, general purpose machine learning on. We have uh, GPUs for you to train and to deploy and run your uh, deep neural networks. And we also have FPGAs, which are specialized hardware that will help you accelerate uh, these AI models. And um, we're very happy to be announcing that we are uh, uh, making um, hardware accelerated models on FPGAs generally available. And that means you can train your deep neural network and accelerate it on an FPGA. So we'll cover all of these uh, in turn. Um, so starting with GPUs, um, in the Azure family of GPUs, we have uh, basically the NC uh, family, which is a general purpose. And this goes for anywhere from 12 to 16 gigabytes of uh, memory for the GPU. And, um, and so these uh, have the InfiniBand networking for, um, uh, for that second network. And that gives you some really good capabilities when you're, doing, uh, when you're using these uh, general purpose GPUs. We also have the ND family, which is specifically for uh, deep learning. So the NDV1, uh, which gives you 24 gigabytes of memory, um, and then also the NDV2 uh, VMs, in which the box has eight GPUs, all connected using NVLeague, and then that way they're able to communicate among each other very, very fast. And so these are just the type of uh, GPUs that, that are available. Um, this summer, we'll also start rolling out uh, Nickel 2 clustering, and so this, this gives you uh, the ability to scale out your, um, uh, your distributed training jobs really, really easily. And this way, uh, using the SROV, this, this extends that infinity band, um, and that way you can run Nickel 2 over, over infinity band. Um, and so Azure is the only cloud GPU provider with, with this uh, infinity band based uh, dedicated backend network. And so uh, really wanting you to scale out that, that training. Um, just a note on quotas. So quotas are limited by the number of cores and basically um, every single VM family per region for a subscription has some default quota. 
Um, and if you uh, want to request more, you can just do that through the portal and request more quota. And just a, a note that there's a there's subscription quota for virtual machines, um, and then there's a separate Azure ML for, uh, for your Azure ML compute. Um, and so just to give you a sample here, let's say you have a 48 cores for the um, NCV3, and so these are just some possible configurations of clusters. Each GPU uh, has, um, has, has with it six vCPUs, and then that way you could configure your nodes based on the different types of uh, GPU machines um, in this way. So, so those are the, uh, some of the details about GPUs. So let's now talk about FPGAs. Um, and FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays, and they're reprogrammable silicon. So you can think of these as uh, reconfigurable chips, and they have a lot of logic gates on it in which you can reconfigure and say, okay, um, if I get this specific input, I will see, I will get this output on this, uh, on this uh, um, um, uh, logic block, and then I have a ton of those that I can reconfigure directly over software, and I can um, reconfigure the connections among all of those logic blocks. And so the nice thing about them is that now I have this piece of hardware, it's put in the data center, I can put it on into my manufacturing plan, I can put it into my retail store, I can put it into my oil uh, refinery, um, and I don't have to change that hardware anymore. So I can deploy my AI model directly onto this chip and run it on the chip, reconfigure that chip. Six months later, if I have a more optimized way of running something, I can then reconfigure that chip with the latest circuitry. So now the model is running directly on the hardware, which makes it super fast, and it's also reconfigurable. The FPGA uh, uses what's called line rate processing. So uh, typically in a CPU, what the CPU is doing, it's reading data from memory, it's processing the data, uh, giving you that result, and then reading data again from memory, and then, and then doing that processing. Uh, in FPGA, what's essentially happening is that the data goes in, it's flowing through all these different logic blocks, and the output goes to the next input, um, and it's flowing through this chip. Um, and so with this line rate processing, it's really effective in being able to process data super fast in that sense. Um, if you do a Bing query today, uh, we actually put a lot of our queries directly on FPGAs. Um, some FPGA models are very large and they span multiple FPGAs in the Bing data centers. Um, in Azure, if you've ever provisioned a VM and selected accelerated networking, um, that, data, uh, that traffic, that network traffic is going through FPGAs. And so we're using a ton of FPGAs today um, and we're also making them available to you uh, to be able to run your AI models um, on. And so um, just to kind of summarize, if I think about the difference between a GPU and an FPGA, um, I like to think of GPUs as kind of your favorite um, uh, car dealership. And let's say it might have 10 repair bays. So there's a repair shop in this car dealership. And if you have 10 cars, and each of those cars needs to get its oil changed and its brakes replaced. So what's happening is these 10 cars drive into these 10 repair bays. Um, there's 10 technicians, and they're changing the oil on all of the 10 cars. And then they're cha uh, changing out the brakes on all of those 10 cars. And then those 10 cars leave the, uh, the repair shop. And so that's essentially what a GPU does. GPU takes in a bunch of data, processes it in parallel, and then that result leaves the GPU. So if you have high batch workloads, if you're trying to process, if you have a million images to process and you can send 256 images at a time to a GPU, that's where a GPU would be really, really effective. GPUs are also very effective when you're doing um, deep neural network training because of the ability to be able to do all of that parallel processing. Um, one of the things to consider about the GPU is that let's say only one car goes into that repair shop. So one technician's working on that one car, nine of those repair bays are going idle. And that's essentially what's happening if you only send one piece of data to a GPU. So you have a lot of this uh, processing power that's going idle um, if you're not utilizing it fully. But where it works, where it works really effectively is if you have a ton of data uh, that you want to process at the same time. So uh, GPUs like that repair shop. So if GPUs like that, then I would think of the FPGA as kind of like a pit stop. So you think of um, going into that pit stop, the entire pit crew is dedicated to working on that car, and then that car leaves. Um, and so that's basically what's happening from, on an FPGA perspective. You have an image that's coming in, uh, it goes into the FPGA, it's being processed, and then it leaves. So some of the use cases for something like this would be in things like manufacturing defect analysis. Uh, so let's say you're, um, you have an assembly line and products are uh, moving down the assembly line. You might have an AOI camera that's taking pictures of the products. These uh, images are going to an AI model and you're trying to identify and predict whether there's a manufacturing defect um, by looking at that picture. And so basically you can process it really quickly, get that result quickly, determine whether you should go down to the next assembly line step, 
or uh, rework or, um, or do anything else uh, so that it doesn't move to the next assembly line step. Um, if you've seen, uh, if you saw Scott Guthrie's talk uh, earlier uh, um, this week, then you saw um, uh, what Kroger was doing uh, with identifying what's out of stock. And so the idea here is you might have some cameras, it's looking at a retail shelf. If you take an item off the shelf, it's able to identify um, that there was a void, that uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, basically no product in that area, and then it can identify that, send you an alert, basically saying restock that shelf. So those models are running on FPGAs um, on a data box edge device. So basically, these are, um, this is the type of uh, hardware um, that's available to you um, in Azure, uh, depending on your need. So we have this suite of hardware um, where, you, where you could um, utilize uh, uh, basically to get the best price and per performance. So that's the, from a hardware side. Uh, now from a model side, um, we also have the uh, Onyx or the Open Neural Network Exchange uh, format and the runtime. So I like to think of Onyx as being the PDF of, uh, of deep learning. So um, you think about the types of frameworks out there. There's a ton of frameworks. You walk down the street, you bump into a data scientist, and you, you, know, you might have a problem for them, and you say, okay, you know, um, take a look at this picture and identify that manufacturing defect. Most likely, that, that data scientist would build something using TensorFlow, right? Nowadays, more and more people are using PyTorch, but the models that they train based on those frameworks um, are not interoperable. And so um, what we need is essentially that PDF. So now, with this Onyx format, Open Neural Network Exchange format, you can convert uh, this model into the Onyx format, or uh, some of these frameworks have native support to, be, uh, to, to, um, to become Onyx models uh, represented. And so now I have this Onyx model, and then I also have the Onyx runtime where I can run this Onyx model. And so the Onyx runtime, you can use it in Azure Machine Learning, you can use it on um, uh, uh, Linux, so Ubuntu VMs, and also um, Windows VMs, or other types of devices. And the nice thing about this is now we decouple the training framework from the execution framework. Um, so from my perspective, my job is to help you run your AI run faster. And if you build a model using TensorFlow, then I need to worry about um, how to make that TensorFlow model run fast. If you build a model using PyTorch, I need to worry about um, making that PyTorch model run fast. And I'm always going to be chasing you. Um, and I'm always going to be, have to uh, follow and, and see which, uh, uh, how do I support all the different frameworks out there. So now if I can decouple that, if I can convert all of your models into Onyx, then I just care about making Onyx models run super, super fast. And so that's the approach that we're taking, so that whatever framework you're using, convert that into Onyx, we run Onyx super fast. And so uh, TensorRT uh, supports Onyx for GPU-based uh, workloads. Um, we're, we're, we're running Onyx on the FPGAs. And then that way we can decouple the training framework um, from, the, from, the, from the runtime. So we talked about the uh, hardware, we talked about some of the, way, um, some of the work that we're doing in terms of uh, the AI models, and now the next thing I wanna talk about is um, deploying these models and where you want to run your, your AI. Um, and so uh, from the left, um, basically you have your MCU based and, and small IoT devices. These are just basically, um, some of them can, uh, I mean, they can run these uh, custom AI models uh, in the Onyx format. Um, but as you start getting to some more powerful devices, whether it's gonna be the edge devices, edge devices again could just be PCs running the IoT edge uh, runtime. Uh, could be these um, uh, more powerful server type uh, um, devices. It could be the edge cloud, or Azure Stack, basically mini Azure, a cluster of machines. Um, or it just could be um, Azure itself or the cloud. So uh, from Azure Machine Learning, you can uh, train your model, it's containerized in a Docker container, and then you can deploy it using IoT Edge uh, to these various uh, Edge devices. Um, and so again, with uh, Scott's demo, uh, you saw that um, identifying the voids on, on the shelves, that was running on a data box Edge device running um, in the store itself, essentially. So now your cameras are taking pictures, they're sending those pictures directly to the Edge device, and then that Edge device is processing the data, so you don't have to send that data to the cloud um, to be able to analyze. The nice thing about this is you can be anywhere um, along the spectrum. 
So you might have a camera that's sending a picture to, a, uh, uh, to an Edge device, like that Databox Edge, um, and then you can decide what image you want to finally send to the cloud. There's a lot of very powerful processing. Or uh, you might want to process data directly on the camera itself. The camera itself may not be able to run very powerful models, but it may be able to do things like uh, detect whether there's a person in the model or uh, whether there's an object um, in this picture. Maybe you're looking for pic um, objects where, uh, uh, um, maybe you're looking for a truck. If I, I detect a truck or a car in the picture, then I send it off to my server. My server can then do the more powerful processing. I can then send that to the cloud if I wanted to aggregate data um, from across the world, for example. Um, so now you can put AI um, into these various places um, all along. And so that's now, um, and that's how we're covering um, uh, the types of AI that you can run and where you want to run the AI and how you want to run the AI. So uh, let me just run through a quick demo real fast and uh, just give you an idea of some of the things that, um, that we've been uh, working on. And, um, and you can see just uh, how, how this would play out um, in, in an enterprise. So let me switch over to my screen here. Um, so what you're seeing here is a Jupyter Notebook, and um, the main thing I want to call out is that as a, as a data scientist, um, or the data scientists in, in, in your uh, enterprise, um, they're using Python and TensorFlow, so there's not anything new that they have to learn. They're just in an environment that they're already familiar with, they're using a language, they're using a framework that they're familiar with. Um, what we're going to do is train a model um, that will detect um, what's in an image. And so uh, first we have our Azure Machine Learning workspace, um, the things that Alex had talked about. And, um, and so what we're going to do is do some pre-processing of the image um, and then uh, put in a featureizer, a deep neural network, um, and, then, and then put a classifier on it. So I'm just blazing through this. You know, as Alex mentioned, this is not a data science talk. Um, but again, the main point here is that this is going to be um, something that a data scientist would be able to do very easily. Um, right here, we're registering that model. And again, as Alex mentioned, what we're seeing a lot in the enterprise is that the rigors of um, managing the data science workflow is not as far along as the software development workflow. So we're seeing data scientists create models. Um, they're throwing them over the edge to DevOps, and DevOps is running them in production. Somebody takes a look at the result of the machine learning model, um, doesn't believe the result, or doesn't really believe that the model is very accurate, and starts asking, um, who created this model? I don't know. Um, where's the source code for this model? I don't know. Um, you know, where was the training data used to train this model? Mm, right, that's basically what we're seeing a lot. Um, and so that's why uh, there's been such a big push for ML ops um, uh, that you've seen here at Build and things like the model management service where you could register um, the model that you, that you, um, oops, that, you uh, that you build. And so let me try to get that up, sorry about that. Um, and so now we're going to go down to uh, containerizing this image and then and then we can do the actual deployment. So we're gonna deploy this model into an AKS cluster um, on an FPJ VM. And again, the main thing just to call out here, I'm just still using Python. I don't need to know anything about FPGAs. I don't know, need to know anything about Verilog or VHDL. What's gonna happen here is this is just going to um, go out and then um, I'm gonna create that AKS cluster and then I'm going to deploy it uh, from my Docker image and the nice thing about this Docker image is that the same image that's, this, that's deployed to the AKS cluster can also be deployed to that Databox Edge device. So Databox Edge device, every single one of them ships with an FPJ card in it. Um, and so you can have this image in your Azure Container Registry, deploy it to your cluster, or deploy it to the Edge. So now you can run this AI model um, also on the Edge. So um, this is using a um, gRPC API, and then in this case, I have, I have a model um, that's recognizing, I'm sending it a picture of a snow leopard, and, um, and what's going to happen is I'm going to see a result. So I'm just going to um, click run here again. You can see here um, that when I run, you can see that the result is that it's predicting a snow leopard with pretty high confidence. Um, and so that's just uh, um, how easy it is to be able to then train this model, containerize it, and deploy it um, where now I'm able to send pictures to it and it's able to predict um, what's, in that, what's in that image. 
Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is um, also working with uh, Fermilab. And I don't know um, how many of you went to Eric Boyd's talk um, earlier this week, Eric Boyd's talk uh, Monday, uh, Monday afternoon. Um, okay, so uh, there um, we were talking about just some of the things that, that um, are being done with um, Fermilab. And actually, um, let me just uh, roll a quick video to give you an idea of, of what they're doing uh, to uh, when it comes to particle physics. So let me go here. If I hadn't gone into computer science, I probably would have gone into particle physics, but I'm not sure I was bright enough for it. And so, oops. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me, categories um, or new brand. Um, it's a little known fact, if I hadn't gone into computer science, so. I probably would have gone into particle physics, but I'm not sure I was bright enough for it. Uh, but we've been working with Fermilab, and so let's see a video of some of the things that they've been doing as they try and push the envelopes of science and how Azure Machine Learning is helping them. What is the origin of our universe? Researchers at the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest particle accelerator, are trying to understand why anything in our universe, every bit of matter, exists at all. The LHC smashes protons together as they travel a 17-mile loop at close to the speed of light, producing more than 500 terabytes of data every second. Researchers then need to filter that raw data in real time to isolate the most interesting events. Scientists at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, CERN, MIT, the University of Washington, and other collaborators, working together with Microsoft, have prototyped their data analysis problem on Azure Machine Learning and demonstrated significant gains in speed. With the ability to accelerate the building and training of sophisticated models, Azure Machine Learning has the scope to handle the LHC's zettabyte-sized data challenge. Soon, it may help researchers identify the handful of collisions among millions that might give insight into the moments after the Big Bang. And so that's really uh, some of the things that, that we're doing um, when you have these AI models and you want to be able to run them super fast. And so one of the models that we took from uh, Fermilab is really taking data from their Large Hadron Collider and uh, determining whether they could detect uh, these top quarks in there. And, um, and so let's see, uh, what's happening here is I have that model, I deployed it onto a CPU, and you can see that I'm getting about um, eight images per second. And so going through the same process that I just showed you using that notebook, deploying that model and running it on an FPGA, you see, you can see that I'm getting about close to 500 and sometimes over 500 images per second. And so this is really what the benefits are when you have um, accelerated hardware that is able to help you run that AI faster. So now there's this there's this model on a typical CPU when you can own process about eight images per second versus 500 images per second in a very uh, cost competitive uh, and, and price competitive way. Now you can process a lot more data. When you can process a lot more data, you can get a lot more insights that will lead to um, better models that will then lead to more value out of the data that you have. And so this is a lot of promise that Fermilab is seeing as they're getting that data and trying to, trying to detect uh, just some of these uh, um, uh, subatomic particles. So uh, just to summarize some of the things that, uh, that we just saw, it's really just uh, Azure Machine Learning with a model management service. When you train that model and register that model, um, it, you have this container image that you can store in Azure Container Registry. Whether it's going to be a model that can run on a CPU, a GPU, or an FPGA, um, this can then be deployed on the uh, right VM um, in uh, AKS. And uh, in this case of the FPGA, we have a gRPC API for CPUs and GPUs. We have a REST API in which you can access that model. And this would be our cloud story, where now you have a Kubernetes cluster where you can scale out uh, in an inferencing perspective. 
We also have the ability to deploy to the IoT Edge. So using IoT Hub, you can connect that to an Edge device. In this case, this is a Databox Edge device but um, for FPGAs, but for CPUs and GPUs, any Linux or a Windows device that can run IoT Edge runtime, uh, is, uh, you, can, you can support that. Uh, from an IoT Edge perspective, the runtime is uh, another Docker container running on this Edge device. You would create a deployment manifest in IoT Hub. This deployment manifest is a JSON document. It gets pushed down to the runtime. The runtime says, I need to pull this container from this registry, instantiates that container, and now I have my model running on this Edge device. So in the case of uh, what Kroger was doing, what you saw there, um, basically, there's, you might have some client code. It's taking in the picture from the camera. It's sending it to the gRPC API. And now, um, in the Azure Machine Learning container, it's running that model on, in that container on the FPGA. And then you can send the results back out uh, through, the, uh, through the runtime back to the cloud, or um, you can send it to the next, next part in the pipeline. And that's really what's happening um, on this Edge device. So, so this is just the uh, architectural view from, uh, from a deployment to the Edge perspective. And so just bringing it all back together, um, data science and AI is just that a really, really exciting time. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, maturing of the data estate, and now uh, enterprises are doing a lot more machine learning and AI, but it's su still super critical to do it um, in an enterprise way that would be safe and secure, uh, but also cost effective. And so. Um, we talked about organizing the workspaces in, in a way that makes the most sense, making things enterprise ready, deploying, operationalizing it, and also managing your costs when you do your training and when you do your inferencing. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. You can train um, and um, deploy models using um, Azure and Azure Machine Learning. Uh, we have a lot of documentation, but most importantly, we'd love to get your feedback. Uh, we'd love to just uh, learn about the types of proof of concepts that you're doing, the types of problems that you're trying to solve, and we're always and we're here to help make that better. So um, we'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.